Our last speaker now is going to is going to bring it home um, for uh, for many of you and and the the work you do for your various uh, uh, particularly for local uh, newspapers and television stations and websites. Judith Gans, uh, she manages the immigration policy program at the Udall Center uh, for studies in public policy at the University of Arizona. Uh, her report on the uh, immigrants in Arizona, the fiscal and economic impact, uh, was a key one to really try and come, come to grips with what, what really is the impact uh, at the state and local level. Uh, and, and you will see that across the country now, similar sorts of reports are being done in state after state after state. They have different results, which is very curious to, to watch. Um, uh, but the model is what Judith has done. Um, I, I'm going to focus a little bit on, um, we've, we've talked a lot about the economics, we've gotten two good overviews and, and detailed discussions of how to understand the economic impacts. I'm going to focus, I do have information on Arizona, but I also want to talk a little bit about some of the debates on fiscal impacts, so I'm deviating a little bit from, from what you've described. I do have information on Arizona that we can talk about. Um, once I get through this initial material, and I can talk with each of you individually um, um, after my time, if, if we run out of time. But there's the, the debates as the, let me figure out how to work this thing. Um, as this robust economic debate um, that we've just had explained, you know, discussed by our two previous speakers, as that's played out in um, in, in the media, in academic papers, the, the economics are actually getting increasingly well understood and the tone has sort of shifted from, um, you know, the sort of doom, doomsday kind of large negative impact to, well, it's on net zero, it's sort of a wash. The theory is straightforward. Um, we know that immigrants lower the wages of workers with whom they compete and tend to raise the wages of workers whose skills are complementary. We've just heard about that. Um, you know, the, these, these, the theory and the, the measurement of this is, is pretty straightforward. Um, and this, you know, rich literature on the nuances of measuring it, we've, we've heard very well described. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to say that there is this presumption that all of these impacts are what should inform policy. Um, that's that's a, a rich discussion in and of itself. It's you know as a political matter. So as a political matter, um, the, the answers to these questions do shape policy in a very real way. But that also implies that the sole purpose of immigration policy is to benefit people within the United States. And that, that's its own philosophical discussion. But what I want to talk about now are the fiscal impacts. Because as the, our understanding of the economic and wage impacts um, has grown, the debate uh, among, especially among those who who advocate restricting immigration has shifted to the fiscal impacts. Um, you know, yeah, it may be a wash in terms of wages and the economy is better off as a whole, but you know, the cost to, to the fiscal impacts are really severe. And that's, there's a lot of, of discussion about that now. And the, the use of immigrants, I'm going to use as an example um, a study that was done by the um, Center for Immigration Studies on immigrant use of welfare. And, and then I'm going to compare it to some work I did looking at the same question. So theoretically, um, again, we know that the safety net costs depend on you know, income. It depends on propensity to use social services. It depends on the, the, the impacts very, very, very dramatically between the federal government and state levels. And this is actually, I think, a, an interesting question in that if you look, for example, at California and New York that have relatively generous social service um, provision compared to, say, Florida and Texas. These are state-level policy decisions that are, um, whose effects are then used to, um, to suggest what federal immigration policy should be. Um, but fundamentally, um, you know, these categories of costs, while they're complex and theoretically 
straightforward to understand. The measurements are really difficult um, because they vary by state and because a lot of the information that we would need to measure them are not really knowable. So we see, you know, my, my first sort of suggestion is that any numbers that you see that purport to um, assert what the fiscal costs of immigrants are should be viewed with great skepticism. Um, and there's a lot of sort of clever use of statistics to suggest um, what those impacts are. For example, um, the Center for Immigration Studies report looked a lot at the percentage of immigrants using welfare. Um, that tells you the propensity of a group to use a service, but it doesn't tell you to what extent immigrants are the source of, wel of welfare spending. You know, the sort of the, those are two different questions, both of which are relevant to policy, but, but a lot of times in an advocacy role, um, statistics are used to create an impression that, that um, serve a point of view but aren't necessarily relevant to the question involved. So what do I mean by all this? Um, th these are the, the statistics that were um, presented in this report and these were derived from, from population survey data and you know the clear impression here is that um, welfare use is driven, driven significantly by immigrant households. And the report goes on to, um, you know, it does acknowledge that, that the usage rates result from um, low levels of education and poverty, but the report talks pretty relentlessly about immigrant use of welfare. It looks at use by uh, country of origin, by Hispanic versus non-Hispanics. By the way, Hispanics are bigger users. Um, by year of arrival, by type of program and doesn't adjust for household income and leaves the reader with this sort of sense of a relentless use of, of welfare um, by immigrants. Um, so I had, it happened that I had um, done some work looking at this. I wanted to look at food stamp use by families with US citizen children. Um, and we divided the family into two, I divided families into two groups. Um, those with US citizen children with two native born parents and then one or more foreign born parent. And then I divided each group into roughly equal sized quintiles to, to, to look at income levels within each group and at welfare use or food stamp use um, within, um, within each of these, these quintiles. Could somebody get me some water? Thanks. And here's, here's what that data looks like um, um, within income quintiles. And, and these are um, each, each category of household is divided into roughly equal sizes. Um, so 58% of negative, I mean, of, of native households. Thank you. This will help. Much better. Okay, so 58% of native households, in the, of the poorest native households in that first income um, quintile, use food stamps. Where only where 52% of, of immigrant households in the lowest quintile use food stamps. Food stamps, and you see the the numbers throughout. Um, um, and just my point a minute ago, as you um, are reporting on this, and you see statistics floating out there. Um, here's an example of, this is the same graph I just showed you a minute ago. Um, this is the percentage of households within each quintile using um, food stamps. But if we wanna know what percentage of food stamp use is done by each, by each household, you get a very different picture. 80% um, of food stamp use within the lowest quintiles is done by native households versus immigrants. And this, I'm showing you, I'm sort of doing this just to illustrate the way that statistics can be manipulated to create an impression. Um, and Excuse me, I'm just not clear on what does that mean, the difference between percent using and percent of use? This tells you the likelihood that a, that a nativity household um, will use food stamps. So if you picked a, a, if you had a group of 
two groups in a room, immigrants and natives, and you randomly drew, um, say, in the, uh, poor, immigrant, poor immigrants and poor natives, and you randomly drew an immigrant, 58% chance that that family, that household head, or that family uses food stamps. This is telling you of all food stamp use by poor people, 80% of it is done by native families as opposed to immigrant families. Okay? And so those kinds of <laughs> fancy, you know, the statistics that, that different advocacy groups use are accurately calculated. Okay? But whether that statistic is appropriate to the point they're making is the question that you should be asking yourselves. I mean, is this really, is that chart on the right really relevant given that obviously the U.S. population is a lot more Native people than it right. is immigrants, and that's right. what that reflects. Right. And that the argument right. I think that the opponents would put forward is that we're bringing people in who right. are poor and therefore are going to use public services. And it's, so do we want essentially people, right. it's not that it's their fault that they're going to need these services, right. just that the people we're bringing in are the people who need it. It depends on the that. question you're asking. If you're asking the question, what are the implications for welfare use of immigration and of low-skill immigration, then that chart on the left is what's relevant. If you're asking, if you're trying to create the impression that the solution to our welfare problem is to get rid of immigrants, that's the graph you should be looking at. Is that what people are saying? No, but I'm just, I, I'm just saying that, that people, that I'm just saying that when statistics are used in an advocacy role, the, the statistics, ask yourself carefully whether the statistics that they're using are relevant to the argument that's being made. The, the, when I read through the Center for Immigration Studies report, there was chart after chart after chart after chart, sliced in all these different ways about immigrant use of welfare. And there, there was an acknowledgement that it's driven by poverty, but the impression, the, the sense was, Immigrants are the problem with welfare use, and we need fewer immigrants because they use a lot of welfare. Um, they're not saying we need fewer low-skill immigrants. They're just saying we need fewer immigrants. And so it's a confounding of what's going on. That's, that's my only point, that, that depending on the point you're trying to make, make sure that the statistics that are being, <laughs> that are being. We'll, we'll have, we're going to have a question and answer session after the break. Okay. So unless there's something factual that you don't understand on the thing, let's hold the question. OK. So, um, so, and so then what I did, uh, you know, a quintile is an arbitrary designation. I wanted to look at, within each quintile, how do immigrant incomes compare to those of native households? And across the board, they're, little, they're lower. And you see the pattern within each of those quintiles. So, you know, that those income differences may be driving the different usage rates. So then what I did was say was to try to, to do I did a more sophisticated analysis rather than just sort of graphing the data. I used probe regression analysis has to do with the probability um, of an event happening and, and the things that fact that that um, um, cause it. And it, probate analysis is used to examine phenomena with two outcomes, yes or no, true or false, use or don't use food stamps. And using data um, at the state level, um, or using st state level data um, for all 50 states, um, I wanted to ask the question, um, in households with US citizen children, holding other relevant factors con constant, how does having foreign-born parents result, does having foreign-born parents result in higher or lower food stamp use? So I was trying to isolate specifically on whether, whether um, the nativity of parents in these, in these households um, had any impact on food stamp use. Okay, and um, so it tells us which, probate analysis can tell us which factors are relevant, the direction of the impact, and the magnitude of the impact. And I looked at household income, household size, the maximum education of head of household to see if education had an effect separate from income, um, duration of unemployment, and then I had dummy variables for whether or not, do you guys know what a dummy variable is? Yes. 
Okay, it's a variable that's that, that's either a zero or one. So in the case of foreign-born parents, having a foreign-born parent would be a one, and not having a foreign-born parent would be a zero. So it's a way of telling the statistics to say, look at, you know, look and see if there are effects around the nativity of, of foreign-born parents. Um, it basically turns a variable on and off in the regression, um, depending on whether it's a zero or a one. Um, then I included a, a, a dummy variable for whether or not the household was in a metropolitan area, whether there's a female head of household, and then um, the, each state, because there are differences in state policies around food stamp use. So the results, um, you know, the, if it was anything different than, you know, some of, the, some of these things, the direction of the impact, if, if we, it should be negative, the, the direction is what you'd expect, that the higher house, household incomes are the lower food stamp use, the higher, um, higher, the bigger the household, the, the greater likelihood of food stamp use. Um, education's negatively correlated, meaning the more educated the head of household is, the less likely there is to use food stamps, duration of unemployment positive, all these are what you would expect. And then with the dummy variables, we can calculate a percentage, you know, the, the, the sort of the magnitude of the impact. So foreign-born parents are actually having foreign, given income, when you control for all these other things, having foreign-born parents, you're actually slightly less likely to use food, the household is slightly less likely to use food stamps. Um, met, metropolitan areas, more likely, female head of households was the biggest um, impact on likelihood of using food stamps. And then the, I sorted the, you can look in the report, the, the states are sorted into more or less relative to New York, which was the median state. Um, it's, we had to pick a median state, which was New York, it turns out. Um, but the, the nuance here, and you know, I, in terms of how you report on this, um, this ends up being a pretty weedy discussion um, about food stamp use, but my goal here is to um, encourage a fair amount of skepticism on some of the claims in the advocacy world about the impacts of some of these things. So where does this leave us? Um, you know, the, the bottom line is that the impression that immigrants are, are relentless users of welfare is misleading. You know, it's poverty, not immigration status, that drives welfare use. And, um, you know, accounting for, for income, households headed by immigrants are less likely to use food stamps. But immigrant households are also, on average, poorer um, than native households. So there is an impact on food stamp use. And isn't there one other thing you haven't mentioned that sometimes gets lost in the reporting is that the immigrants do not get the welfare benefits. It's is only it? the qualifying U.S. citizens right. in the household. Right, right. And that's, Which, yeah. That it's often just, isn't, I mean, it's implicit, but sometimes yes. I think it's yes. misleading that it's not explicit right. in a lot that's of the true. stories yeah. you read. But the policy implications of this aren't straightforward. Um, you know, if, okay, we circling back to, to the two previous discussions and where I started, in terms of the economic impacts, we know, we know the wage impacts, and we know, you've, you've been eloquently told, that it, it centrally depends on the extent to which immigrants and natives are substitutes. Um, I wanted to also circle back to what Giovanni was talking about in terms of the, the brawn, um, manual labor versus cognitive stuff. Um, this, I think, is a really interesting graph because a lot of the debate around impacts on low-skilled workers, and this speaks to substitutability. When you hear claims they're taking jobs, Americans, taking away American jobs, that's implicitly saying immigrants are substitutes. When they're saying they're doing jobs Americans won't do, that's implicitly saying they're complements or that, or that they're not substitutes. Um, but a lot of the debate has been concerned about the impacts of immigration and low-skill often per and often illegal immigrants on native-born low-skill workers. This is looking at five-year age cohorts um, of people with zero to eight years of schooling. And you'll notice that the vast majority or the majority of native-born, the blue bars, with zero to eight years of schooling are 50 and older. And the vast majority of, in particular, non-citizens um, 
with that level of education are 50 and under. Those are two very, you know, that, that should raise all kinds of questions about, about complementarity and substitutability in the labor market. Um, if you're 65 years old, you're probably not interested in, um, you know, working picking tomatoes or being on a roof nailing on roofing shingles in 100 degree Phoenix weather. Um, so, so these kinds of things matter to, to substitutability. Um, so getting back to the fiscal impacts, if low-skill immigrants are poor and more likely to use welfare, I'm going to leave this as a question, um, should we be seeking to limit low-skill immigration? And the, the question, the answer to that question depends on to what extent types of workers are relatively scarce in the, in the larger population. We, Giovanni was talking a lot about the benefits to high school workers, uh, the benefits of these complementarities. So there's a, there's a um, trade-off, if you will, um, allowing low-skilled immigrants to come in makes high school workers more productive, but it also has impacts on social safety net that need to be understood in a nuanced way. And that's, that's a political decision, but um, it's a complicated one, so.